The right habits put you in control of your health, relationships, mindset, and more. But most people lack the tools to stick with those habits long enough to see results. That is about to change. Welcome to the Unshakable Habits Podcast with your host, habit change specialist and speaker, Stephen Box. Join us each week as experts share their stories, experiences, and insights and give you the tools to build unshakable habits so you can live life on your terms. It's time to take your habits from unsustainable to unshakable. Welcome to the Unshakable Habits Podcast. I am your host, Stephen Box, and I'm joined today by Ren Jones from Fitness Jones Training. Ren, thanks for joining me, man. Hey, man, I'm so happy to be here, Stephen. I appreciate you having me, man. Absolutely. My pleasure, man. Ren, you got a great story of transformation. But before we jump into that, I do want to remind the audience about the Unshakable Framework that we're going to look at your story through because that's what's going to help people take what you did and apply it to their life. So the first step of that... They got to have a vision, Mm -hmm. not a goal. Goals are about outcome. Visions are about what you want your life to look like when you get there. Mm -hmm. Of course, to get there, you're going to need some skills. And you're either going to have to develop those skills or you might already have them and you might not be tapping into them. So we're going to figure out what skills Ren had to develop to make his transformation. And then finally, we're going to talk about what actions Ren took to develop those skills because those actions are the third part of the framework. Sound good, Ren? Oh, man, I love it. I love it. So I want to start your story off actually in the present day before we go to the past. Okay. Because because when people look at you now, they're going to see Ren Jones, the the fit guy. They're going to see the guy who hosts a podcast. They're going to see the guy who posts all this meaningful, insightful stuff on social media. They're going to see the successful business owner. They're going to see the guy who coaches other coaches. They're going to see all these things that Ren does. And they're going to be like, man, I could never be like Ren. Ren is like the greatest thing ever. (laughs) Right. And I didn't even talk about how you were once on Showtime at the Apollo. So, you know, people are going to be looking at this and going, man, how can I possibly be Ren? But the thing about the thing I love about your story, man, is when we start with your story, people are going to see that you weren't always this successful. You had right. success areas in your life, but mm-hmm. there were a lot of struggles and a lot of hardships that you had to go through to get to this point. And I hope that gives people hope because they can see that no matter where they are, that there's that opportunity for them to grow and get to the same place where you are now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Uh, I, I love, I love that. Um, you know, like I said, first of all, I'm just happy to be here, man, uh, and get the opportunity to talk to people. And you're absolutely 100% on the money, man. You know, a lot of things on social media look like they happen overnight. But for me, just just from that little area where I was trying to make it in the music business, you know, being on Showtime and Apollo till today, bro, you're talking about, I don't know, 20, 22 years ago. Um, which is ironic because I'm only 25 years old, but you know, but it was, but it was that long ago. I'm 47, you know, it was that long ago, man. Uh, and it's easy to look like an overnight success on the internet because people are catching you at a, at a snapshot in your life, right? There's no context on the internet. Usually like you get the person where they are now, you haven't been, first of all, there was no internet when I was in my twenties. Uh, let's just start there. There's no such thing. Uh, not as, not as we know it today. Um, but yeah, man, I, you know, I'm happy to start in, in the now, Steven, you know, uh, I, I coach clients, you know, I coach coaches, uh, I coach coaches, coaches also for fitness, I do a podcast. You know, I've written a few articles for uh, a few different uh, publications. I got an article out there for ACE right now, an article for the Personal Trainer Development Center. Um, You know, I've been able to contribute to a few books. You know, I haven't written a book yet, but, you know, I've been able to contribute, you know, them through colleagues. 
Um, and, uh, and I really love what I do, man. Like, I, like at this point in my life, I absolutely can't imagine doing anything else, but yeah. you know, like you said, it's a hard road to success, man. Um, yeah. you know, I'm here for the ride today. So, so let's take, let's take it back to the, those humble beginnings. Yeah, so, man. So, so talk to, talk to me about where were you at in life? when you really got this vision to move into health, fitness, and trying to change people's lives? Yeah, man. Man, that's a great question. Uh, that's probably why you're a podcast host, because uh, you ask great questions. So uh, so I was in corporate America, man. You know, my background was in business. I graduated from school uh, with, with, business, with business degree. I was working at an insurance company, uh, an international insurance company. Um, and, uh, and I was a sort of a sales trainer, a sales manager. I was running a few offices, man. And, uh, and I was just for lack of a better term, just hating life, right? Just, you know, I working 12, 13 hours, not that I work less now, but 12, 13 hours for yourself and 12, 13 hours for somebody else. As I'm sure, you know, uh, box. I call him box, by the way, guys. So if you hear me say box, I'm referring to Steven because, because we're homies. Uh, so as you know, box, you know, it's, it's different when you're working for yourself, man, but I was hating it, man. Stressed out, uh, you know, um, uh, heartburn in the mornings, you know, queasy stomach in the evening, just total stress ball, man. And I was trying to, I was trying to build like a business in, in under, the business I was working in, it was one of those deals where you could recruit people to your, to your, your sales team for insurance. And you, you know, you get, you get higher, you get ranked higher and higher, almost like multi-level marketing, but it was legitimately an insurance organization yep. where I could build my own office up. So I was working on that man at that, at that point. And like I said, I was just totally stressed out, man. Um, you know, I, I had dealt with a few situations uh, with loss of family members. Um, and I, and I, I know you probably want to circle back to that, but, uh, I got to the point where I was like, and he sort of, here's where the vision came in for me. I got to the point where I was like, if I'm working this hard for somebody else, uh, and waiting for them to pay me what I believe I'm worth, um, mm -hmm. why can't I just work the same amount for myself? uh, earn more income, you know, if I'm going to be spending the hours, why not spend the hours on myself? So my vision was to sort of re release myself from what I felt like were like the shackles of corporate America, um, influence people in a positive way, but also with prioritizing whatever time I had left on the planet. Like, so my overall vision was I can do the same thing I'm doing for them for myself and I can reap my own rewards and that'll allow me to direct my influence where I want it to go to pop, to, to impact people in a positive way, but using my methodology, doing, doing it my way. So I guess that's sort of the overall vision. Yeah. You know, I was, I recently joined clubhouse and I was checking out your profile because mm -hmm. I, I straight stole your uh, profile. And you should have just, just, you know, I mean, like details and everything. I told people I was on Showtime, the Apollo, the whole nine. Yeah, just... man, I'd be offended if you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> one thing, that, one thing that stood out to me when I was looking at your profile was you talked about your family and how, yeah. you know, you, you had some people who got sick, who, you know, unfortunately passed on. Mm -hmm. And you say that one of your motivations for getting into the health field in particular was that you wanted to become the person that you wish that you could have been for your family when they needed you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that I do, as you, as you know, Stephen, one of the things I do is I talk to coaches all the time uh, or, or around the world. Uh, and when I say coaches, I mean, fitness and wellness coaches, nutrition, exercise about their own business. And one of the things that we talk about, again, you're very, you're, you're very uh, knowledgeable about this it's sort of that unique selling proposition, um, what it is that's different for us and, and the why behind the demographic that we work with as a coach. And one of the phrases I often use with these coaches when I'm talking to them about helping them try to pinpoint who they wanna work with 
is sort of think about a time in your life when you needed something along your own journey and then go back and try to become that thing that you would have needed. And for me, you know, getting into the details of what Steven's alluding to is, you know, I lost my older brother, Rodney, while I was wor working that corporate job that I talked about. Actually, Stephen, I was six months into that corporate job when I got a call from home that my big brother, Rodney, had a had a heart attack. He had a, a massive heart attack. It was fatal. He died instantly. Um, and that sort of set me on the path of recognizing what time is like, because literally, and I don't know if I've ever told this particular part of his story, Stephen, but um, his... His wife, my sister-in-law, Joni, she went into the shower to take a shower. While she was in the shower, my brother was downstairs. He had sort of like a man cave downstairs in his house. Uh, and Joni's son called. Uh, she had been married before. She had an adult son. So her son, Keenan, called. Uh, Rodney took the message. He, he went up to the shower, you know, the bathroom door. He said, hey, Joni, Keenan's on the phone. And she said, okay, tell him I'll call him back. And he was like, okay. My brother went back down. Just shower said hey what do you want am i down in she got into the shower a wife and she got out of the shower a widow and man you know that affected me in a way not only the fact that i lost my big brother but that story man so how instantaneous life is in terms of switching things totally like her entire life changed drastic and mine changed drastically in 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 the time it takes to take a shower uh, so, uh, my mother who had been disabled many years before that, uh, she had a stroke while I was in college. Uh, she was living with my brother and his wife at the time. So when my brother died, of course, my sister-in-law was grief stricken. Uh, my older sister, Robin lived in the same city with her husband. So my mother moved in with them. Um, and I know we had a conversation before we started, Stephen, you're giving your mother great care right now, which is awesome. You're, you're an upstanding young man in every way. Uh, but so my mom moved in with my sister. Well, four years after my brother died, my sister drank, got in a car, hit a tree and died instantly. Um, my sister's husband, who was a dialysis patient at the time, he had kidney failure, stopped going to his dialysis, refused it out of grief, uh, died 90 days to the day after my sister died. So I'm living in the city, you know, about 150 miles away from my hometown. I'm in an apartment trying to run this business that I'm stressed out about. You know, my mother and her brother, my uncle are in the same city. My aunt was there uh, from time to time. So my mother goes into extended care because she's buried two children at this point, two adult children. Both my brother and sister died at age 50. Um, I'm 47 now, by the way, I'm a dancer jig when I hit 50, man. Uh, so, so, so my mother goes into his extended care and I'm going back and forth from the city I live in to the city where my mother is, you know, to visit her regularly. I'm failing at work, uh, because I'm, I'm super, you know, I buried two siblings while I'm trying to build this business, super demanding boss, toxic environment, um, I, I end up losing my uh, my apartment. I get evicted. Um, I lo lost more than one vehicle. Had vehicles repossessed. Um, and 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 now as I'm going back and forth, uh, trying to see my mother, borrowing cars, renting cars, whatever whatever I can do. Um, you know, I'm sitting with my mom, and I see a I see a, a a a commercial about National Academy of Sports Medicine. I'm literally in the extended care facility with her watching football on Sunday. My mother loved football. She was a Pittsburgh fan. Uh, you know, I don't condone that, but that's that's what she liked. Uh, so I'm sitting and I'm watching, and it's like this commercial is talking to me, man. It's like a sitcom. It's like, have you ever considered being a personal trainer? And I was like, yeah. But you're concerned about the cost involved in the certification? I was like, yeah, the cost is a concern for me. You know, would you like to pay over time, you know, equal payments? I'm like, yeah, I would. You know, we can call this 800 number, bro. I called the 800 number from my mother's hospital bed. Um, and, and that sort of led me into that, into that space. Um, it was, it was March. So I, I enrolled in like December. My mother died February 29th, 2014, March 17th, 2014. I took my test and passed exam, bro. I cried all the way home from the exam. Uh, and I've been in this business ever since. And what I needed at that time to circle back the long way, taking a wagon trail back around to your question 
is what I needed at the time was I needed somebody for my mom, particularly uh, before she had that stroke, somebody, you know, charismatic, obviously incredibly good looking. Uh, that goes without saying. Uh, somebody charismatic, sort of easygoing, that would have gotten my mother to move a little bit more than what she did. She wasn't an obese woman, but she smoked. Medical professional. She was stressed all the time. Could have gotten her to move a little bit more than she did. Um, not take away the foods that she enjoyed eating. Um, and, uh, and, and been able to dedicate herself to health a little bit. So my USP became, I help moms over 30, you know, get in incredible shape without restricting foods and without spending hours in the gym. So I became, you know, as you alluded to in that clubhouse bio, I became the thing that I would have needed at my lowest point because my mother had that initial stroke, probably eight, seven or eight years before my brother died. But part of his stress was related to the stress of taking her, taking care of her. And my brother was a softy, man. He was a mama's firstborn son, like attached to her hip. Um, you know, my sister with addictive personality, alcoholism, I felt like, you know, health intervention could have helped there too, you know, exercise, nutrition. So that that's sort of that's sort of the rough edge of me coming into this business uh, through losing family members, through evictions at some point through uh through you know uh having cars repossessed i know what it's like to see my own taillights on the car going down the street as i run out of my front door man you know it's not a, it's not you know it's it's a forgettable experience uh yeah. it's something that you want to forget um but yeah that's that's sort of how i came to this place man you know yeah. again great question thanks so much for asking that yeah and, and that's that's the thing man is i love that you are so willing to be open and honest about that because and you notice man you coach other coaches so i know you see this so often we are so afraid to tell people about our struggles we're yeah. so afraid it's going to make us seem incompetent or that it's, people are going to think that we're not worthy of you know helping them or whatever the case mm -hmm. may be and I just, I think it's so important, man, that we get more people. And that's one of my motivations for starting this podcast. Yeah. I want to bring on people who are super successful in life, who've done amazing things and show that they're not walking around with, with capes and S's on their chest. They're <laughs> normal people who have been through real ish. <laughs> real ish, bro. Like, you know, I, I don't know how many coaches are going to be listening versus, you know, just people that are just listening for the inspiration of what I know you bring to people. Um, it's one of the reasons why you're one of the elite coaches that we have in this industry, you know, working with, uh, working with an organization like Precision Nutrition. But I want to tell you guys this, like, if you've never heard the phrase before, uh, it's a true phrase that people buy based on emotion and they justify it with logic. Mm -hmm. Well, in the case of coaching, people buy based on your humanity and they justify it with your credentials. Like my credentials, and I'm sure you can speak to this box. My credentials have never gotten someone to hire me to be a coach. My personhood has, and then they'll say, oh, and you're also, you know, a certified nutrition coach, certified trainer. Uh, so if, if there are coaches out there listening, particularly in our industry, but in any personal business, and yeah, whether you're a lawyer or a, a financial planner, like, people need to understand your humanity in order to be able to resonate with you. And then when they, when they're ready to quote unquote, hire you, uh, then you've got credentials to back up why yep. that it supports the emotional connection that they're feeling to you. But man, don't operate outside of your humanity. Uh, yep. cause that's, that's the, that's the equal, that's the differentiator differentiator, right box. Like that's yep. knowing us is what makes us worth hiring, uh, effectively. Yep. I mean, absolutely, man. I mean, when you think about if if I go to one person's website and they're certified in something and I go to somebody else's website and they're not, most people assume that I'm going to automatically go to the person who's certified. Right. Now, if all else is equal, then yes, I would choose the certified individual over the non-certified individual. Right. But if the person who doesn't have a certification, if they tell me a story and it sounds just like my story, Right. And I'm like, they understand what I'm going through. I, they can solve my problem. And the other person is just this like vague trying to like help everybody out. They're not sharing any of their story. Yep. They're just talking about like, oh, fat loss and or whatever. Right. 
I'm not going to hire that person regardless of what certification they have because I believe the other person has the solution to my problem. Absolutely. And, that, and that's what it comes down to. People need to know that you understand a problem and you can solve it. Yes. Yeah. You, you've been somewhere you got. So if you guys are listening out there, Box just say he just he just solved 95 percent of your marketing problems just then in ways to just rewind what he said and keep listening to it. Print it out. Put it on your mirror like you've got to resonate with the people that you're serving. And if they understand that there's more commonality with you. Maybe even if there's more commonality than there are credentials, you're much more likely to get, uh, you, you're going to be sought after because people need to know your story, man. Like it's, there's just no way around it. Um, that, that's a great point box. I love that, man. I think I might have sold that one from you too, if possible. It might. I, again, I'd be offended if you did not take it from me. Uh, I don't want you, I don't want you paying attention to any other coaches out there. Just, <laughs> just me. I'm self self centered narcissistic coach. Uh, I want everybody paying attention to me. I'm the center of the known universe. That's not true. I, will, um, I won't. I won't tell you that I've been cheating on you with other coaches. Then. Okay. Oh man. Gosh, you know, they're different I'll, fields, though. Different fields. All right. Though, okay. Man. All right. Because I almost said a bad word. I almost said a swear word, man. I don't, don't make me do that. <laughs> I'm, tr- I'm trying to be good. <laughs> so, so going going back to your story, man. You you went to. You, you saw this commercial, you called a number and, yep. and you, you go and get certified. Yep. So now I know for me, my journey through the fitness industry over the last decade plus has been a wild ride. Like, yeah, I'm not where I am today is not where I, where I started. As a matter of fact, fitness and nutrition, when I started, fitness was the only thing I was doing. So it was literally a hundred percent of my, my approach. And now I can say that fitness and nutrition accounts for maybe like 10% of what I help people do. It's such Absolutely. a small percentage because I understand the bigger picture now. So kind of walk us through the skills that you had to develop along the way. Yeah, man. I love talking about skills, man. Uh, but I love talking about action too. So I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of excited for, for the last part too. Cause as you, as you, you know, intertwine them if you want, if, if that's easier for you, as, as you know, action is where it's at, man. Um, so, so skills first, so because of the demographic that I started to work with, um, which was which was moms, effectively. Um, so spoiler alert, I'm not a mom. Uh, <laughs> second, <laughs> second. On, interv- interview over. I thought, yeah. I thought I was interviewing a mom. Hold on. We shut this thing down, man. I'm out. I'm out. That's it. I'm done. You know, like when those angry stars and walk off the set. Oh, that's it. I'm done. Uh, so but second, I'm not even a parent. Right. So how do I relate to this demographic? Well, I'm the son that dealt with the sum of choices that their mother made, right? So so the first skill I had to develop was I had to learn the language of the demographic that I don't belong to. Like, I don't get to talk to moms a lot. So I had to start following, and this is where social media becomes becomes helpful. Uh, and I guess this intertwines with the action a little bit because I knew I had to develop the skill of speaking the language that this demographic of people was, was, was speaking. So as an actionable item, uh, I went and got out, uh, went out and got a few certifications. One that comes to mind immediately is Girls Gone Strong. Um, uh, our, our friend Molly Galbraith, um, who wrote a phenomenal book uh, about uh, strong women lifting each other up. Um, I, so I started following their page. Uh, I started, uh, I got into a group for coaches that they have. Uh, and I just listened, man. You know, my, my action item in terms of developing the skill of the language of the people I was dealing with was just listening. Uh, started reading things like Oxygen Magazine, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. You know, the jury's out on what publications are good for what. Um, I started surveying and sampling the few clients that I had that were in that space, right? Listening to them, uh, having exit interviews when they left my programs, just learning all I could, soaking up the language of that population because the mm-hmm. developing that language was a skill that I needed. And I put my foot in my mouth a lot, a, a few times along the way, you know, using language that I did not know was um, sort of just generally not complimentary of the, of the group of people that I was working with uh, calling women females. They, and they would say a female, what 
uh, because female doesn't describe the individual. Female denotes, you know, the gender, well, more technically the sex of the whatever it is, you know, learning, learning things like not complimenting them on how they look. It's just never right to do that um, if, if they've lost weight, because I don't know if they've lost weight because they're because there's an illness or I don't know if they were choosing to lose weight. It denotes that somehow they were less valuable before they lost weight, like learning all the subtle nuances and the complexities of speaking uh, effectively and also empathetically to that, to that group that I work with. And that was a skill development, man. I, I had to really listen a lot more. Actual listening was, was a thing for me. So one of the skills was learning language. Another skill was learning the anatomy and physiology, the slight differences between, as you know, as Dr. Stacy Sims says, who's sort of an expert on uh, menopausal athletes. Uh, of course, that means women specifically. You know, women are not just small men. Like so, I had I had to develop the skill of understanding the differences in physiology and anatomy hormonally uh, that women have, and again that that took me to another certification. So I worked through girls gone strong pre and postnatal certification, and I'm working through their level one, you know, any women right now means being content that I are so listening to audio books about the subject specifically of women's anatomy and physiology, the change of perimenopause, the postmenopause, like, so my action item there of developing the skill of understanding the differences physically was uh, a lot of reading, certification processes, you know, audio books, reading articles, uh, consuming everything that I could in terms of that, in terms of that demographic. And then I had to develop the skill of sales and marketing, right? Because Box, you and I know what a big part of that is, of our business that is. And it's not something you consider when you want to quote unquote, help people, yep. whether it's fitness or nutrition or mindset, which is most of what we do at this point. Like, like you said, you know, there's a little fitness and a little nutrition. Most of it's behavior change, mindset. So, so I had to develop the skill of um, of marketing, selling, branding my business. Right, otherwise nobody can find you. And, and the action item there was again a lot of reading, more coursework. We both been through the online trainer academy. Uh, that's that's done through the Personal Training Development Center, teach us how to do business online specifically. So, you know, that that overnight success, it, it boiled down to like, like Boxer said, you know, maybe a decade worth of learning, man, maybe 10 years of overnight success. And every time somebody asked me, you know, you know, sort of what your vision, what what my vision was, what my goals were, I would always say I'm five years away. I'm five years away. 10 years, 10 years later, you know what I'm telling people? I'm about five years away, right? I, I just I just sort of mm-hmm. built everything on the fact that it's not going to come quick or easy. So yep. those are some of the skills and actions that I had to jump into. Another great question, man. I love that. So you said a couple things in there that really, I think, are, are worth pulling out and showing people in some different contexts, too. And on one, the, the first thing you said that really popped out, this is one of my unshakable keys in our conversation is you don't praise people for an outcome. Right. And, you know, this is something I've known for a while now, you know, having been someone who studied behavior change and understanding that we want to praise the behaviors. We want to praise the actions that led to an outcome if they're positive behaviors. We don't want to praise an outcome because we might be reinforcing a, a negative behavior. Absolutely. Absolutely. But somebody somebody posted something on, something on social media the other day, man, on Facebook that I saw that gave me even a new perspective to this, and I'm sure you can appreciate this, is this was somebody who had a gastro bypass surgery, mm-hmm. and they lost all of this weight, and they said that when they were thinner, they kind of put some of the weight back on now, but they uh-huh. said when they were thinner the worst thing to them actually was all the people who came up and told them how great they looked and how right. they seemed seen much healthier and all this other stuff because it made them feel like they didn't look great before. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's 100%, man. And that's, and that's, that's a cautionary tale of, yep. again, why you don't praise the outcome. Yep. You just, 
you don't know. And I understand it, right? I like, yeah. I get it. It's instinctive human nature. Yeah. It's something that we, we feel like it's being very pleasant to the person that we're inter- interacting with. Um, and that's just lack of training. Like we, we don't, we don't develop a skill for this uh, through, through, through effort and through learning. We just sort of do what we know to do based on what we've seen other people do. So, hey, man, you look great, man. Oh, have you lost some weight? Man, you look awesome. Mm-hmm. And it oftentimes immediately does make you feel like um, like there was something wrong with you before. It's hard to take that compliment. You know, in terms of what you said about praising the outcome versus praising the habits, you know, what that looks like sort of in real time is, uh, oh, way to go. You lost you lost uh, 10 pounds last month, way to go, versus great job. You got you you got all your workouts in that you intended to do last month, uh, mm-hmm. and you were so good about checking in uh, for your nutrition. Let's keep that going. You know, in terms of, you know, kids, it's the difference between saying you're so smart versus you're a hard worker, you know, mm-hmm. because saying you're a hard worker allows the child to continue to work hard you know, at every level, because it's going to get more difficult. Saying they're smart sets this sort of ceiling that if they get into a situation where they can't excel, they feel like it's fundamentally an identity Mm -hmm. issue. I'm just not smart enough versus I'm not working hard enough. Uh, So, Mm -hmm. you know, Box Box is a master of a sort of behavior change. He's got to be because he works with uh, Precision Nutrition. They're all about that. but it is important to lean into the behaviors and reinforce those things much more than the outcome. And and that's what I did in the context of my own life, man. You know, I went from the point of getting, you know, (laughs) a view running down the street behind my car, a nice 98 Acura Integra silver. Uh, I had the little rear spoiler, uh, you know, running behind that car down the street um, to having savings that will sustain me for years. And it wasn't the outcome of having the savings. It was the behavior of every time I get paid, 10% goes towards a credit card bill, 10% goes into savings. For me, 10% goes to donate for tithing. I'm a preacher's kid, sue me. Uh, But 10% goes to my church home. Like those behaviors lead you to places where you're, where you're benefiting. I, I think, I think James Clear and Jonathan Goodman will love another James Clear reference. I think James Clear said that good habits make time your ally and bad habits make time your bully. Uh, So that's, that's a great point that you made box. Yeah. Yeah. You, you you talk about the, uh, the James Clear quote. The other one that that I love is that you're, you don't fail to the level of your, your habits. You fail to the, or you rise to the, Right, so your systems your... or whatever. Yeah, basically, yeah. the the idea is when you have good systems in place, you're successful. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I learned that lesson actually early in my career. I remember reading the book The E Myth. Yeah, I Michael read that Gerber. book too. Yeah, good and, book. And, th- and that's what got me hooked on the idea of systems. And when you yeah, understand, man. I mean, and really, all habits are is systems. That's all they are. That's all just they are. It's just behaviors and systems. That's it. So, yeah. something you pointed out in there that I think people miss sometimes, right? Especially in the moment, because Mm -hmm. let's be real. When you are in that stressed out job, like you were when you were working that corporate job, when you're trying to build this business, you get so focused on the outcome of what success looks like, especially when that success is not internal, when it's not your values that you're putting out there, it's the expectations being put on you by others. Mm -hmm. You can get so focused on that outcome. And this applies to weight loss, job promotions, anything. Mm-hmm. When you are so focused on out, on the outcome itself, you do not realize all the negative things that are happening to you. Right. And when you finally do realize the negative things, our first instinct is not to reflect on them and grow, but instead to try to get away from them as fast as humanly possible. Oh, yeah. And you mentioned like, you know, watching this, you know, car, not that you remember the car at all. <laughs> 1998 silver Acura Integra yeah. Coupe. No, I don't remember it. Yeah. But you, you were, you remember watching this car go down the street <laughs> and what that did for you was it taught you to say, you know what? 
I never want to be in that situation again. So I'm going to put some money back each month. So you developed a good habit yep. because you had that hardship. Had you never had the experience of watching your car go down, you might still be loose with your money. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, that's that's that might be the best point of the whole <laughs> the whole episode. Like, so we've, we've it, turned this into a financial seminar. Now. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, now, now I'm Tony Robbins. Uh, so, so, you know, for, for the folks listening out there, what Box is saying effectively is, you know, stuff's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. It's just going to like, nobody gets an easy ride here. Like, I don't care. You know, even, even people that are born into wealth are going to have a problem. Money's not going to be the problem, but you're going to have some problems no matter what you have a couple of options. Like, like he just, like Steven just said, you can run away from it right? Try to get away from it. People, people exercise away from it. People drink away from it. People smoke away from it. People shoot needles away from it. Or you can, as we say in precision nutrition box, you can rest with the discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. yep. You can learn from it and make a new set of choices. Um, but you, there's always an education in the middle of that situation that you can choose to increase your intellect or you can yeah. choose not to. Um, and choosing not to has always been super beneficial for me in the long road. It It's awful. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel awesome. Um, but man, you can't run. There's, there's nothing that I've experienced that you can run away from forever. Um, yeah. You know, it's just, you just can't, man. You, so, so you just jump down in it, get in that discomfort, uh, and you decide that you're going to make some new choices and you just stack some habits up, you just stack, build a process and follow yep. it, follow the process out of the hole. Um, that, that's a great point box. Um, that, that needed to be said. I appreciate that, man. Yeah. So rent one thing that has come up over and over in multiple interviews that I've done is that in order to create unshakable habits in your life, you need a support system, whether Absolutely. that's a spouse, a best friend, a professional coach, a mentor, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. everybody needs support. I know, especially us men, we think we can do it all by ourselves. Absolutely. Think, you know, you, you can't guys. Right. No, no, <laughs> no, no one has successfully done it on their right. own. Even, right. even Batman had to get a sidekick, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Batman was highly dependent on Alfred, by the way, in addition yeah. to Robin. Uh, right. People don't talk about that much, but Alfred got him out a lot of stuff. I, I, I really I really think is Alfred as the sidekick. Right. Yeah. Ro Robin's just a tag along. Alfred yeah. really is a guy. You need, to, you need a guy in the chair, as they say. Yeah. Uh, so can, kind of talk to us a little bit about, because I know you do this, you know, as a coach for both people in the fitness and health area, as well as for business coaches. Mm-hmm. So talk to us a little bit about your experience on the other side of that. What what kind of challenges do you see that people have when they don't have a support system? So they're just coming to you. They're just starting to get that support. What, what are they missing out on before they get that? Yeah. So the first big problem with not having support is the immediate sense of isolation, right? Uh, and, and when I say isolation, I mean you will believe that you're the only person struggling with fill in the blank. Uh, and that's really very isolating because you, you turn it inward, you say, and you'll start to, you'll start to use language in your own mind. Like, why can't I get clients or why can't I build a business or why can't I get in shape or why can't I stop consuming so much sugar? Why can't I stop this? So in the absence of support, that's like, Man, that's that's 10 X in your own brain. Um, you got to get around other people that are that have dealt with the same situations that you've had to know that it's not a you thing. It's just a it's just a, a back to skills. Right, Stephen? Like, it's just a mm -hmm. skills thing. You yep. not, you do not yet have the skill that you need to get to where you're going. <clears throat> but the shocking thing is there are people all over the world that are in, that are in very that are at various levels of the same problem that you've dealt with some that are yet to experience some of the things that you've had happen that you can mentor 
Mentoring feels great when you're working through your own problem. And obviously some that are in front of you that have solved most of what you're about to go through. Having support helps you to not feel so isolated. The second thing that support does is it allows you to sort of take a step back and sort of have the out of body experience and be a little bit more accurate in how you're seeing your own situation. Because we can tell ourselves we're doing everything. Oh, I'm doing everything right and I'm on top of it and it's just not working. That's usually not the case. And I and again, I know Stephen can speak to this being being a, a precision nutrition certified uh, coach. It's usually not the case that you're doing everything that you think you're doing. Like, you know, and I and I'll throw out this this scenario, Stephen, and tell me if you've had this experience. You get a new person, right? And they say, uh, I don't think I eat that bad. And I'm doing, I, you know, I'm doing everything right. And I just don't know why I can't, whatever the goal is. Yep. And you tell me if you had this happen, Stephen, you start to get a journal in or you start to work with them over a month, their, their response to, uh, to, um, to obligations is sporadic, right? Mm -hmm. They don't get back to you in terms of checking in. Uh, you start to see a list of the things that they're eating and it's, uh, you know, three iced coffees from nine till 12 for a total of 1500, you know, liquid calories, you know, <laughs> didn't eat all day, had no vegetables, you know, binged on, you know, Twizzlers and pop has a wine. Like, have you experienced? Your 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 internet broke up just a little bit, but I oh. but I cut the gist of what you're saying. Basically, yeah. they're when they come to you, their impression is that it's not huge things, right? That it's not as big as it is. So it's you know, well, hey, you know, I, I'm looking over your food journal and I and I see a couple of things we can definitely discuss. They're like, well, you know, I don't understand why I'm not losing weight because I'm not eating that much. You know, I just had a couple of coffees and right. <laughs> <laughs> like, a couple of twelve hundred coffees calorie. have six hundred calories a piece. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> a couple of twelve hundred calorie coffees before I ate out of the vending machine at work. You know, yeah. uh, you know, before I had a you know fifteen hundred calorie McDonald's extra. Like so, having support, having support allows somebody outside you to sort of get a uh, an accurate context of what's mm -hmm. going on. This works in business. It works in relationships. It works in everything. Like having some trusted support around you that can take a look for you, you know, you go, you go mentally blind to things, right? Like how we say you go nose blind, like you got some stinky trash in your apartment, mm -hmm. you know, after a while, you don't even smell it. Somebody else comes in and Oh yeah. God, man, what's, what did you kill in here? What's something's dying in your apartment. And you're like, Oh man, I can't smell it. A lot of times when you're in these mm -hmm. skill, these change processes, when you have that vision, like Steven talked about when you're, when you got to develop those skills, when you're taking those actions, you can't see where your vision is lacking sometimes or where your skills need help or where you're inactive sometimes. So having people around you support sort of keeps you on task, man. That's, that's a, that's a really important, um, that's a really important question, uh, Stephen, to, to ask yourself. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's brilliant that you brought that up in the context of developing those, those, unshakable habits man so now, for, for I'm, real I'm gonna, I'm gonna add something to your answer though do and, it and i know and i and i know you just didn't think about bringing this up but i know you're gonna agree with it having a coach or a mentor especially someone you hire who doesn't have a personal connection to you because trust me anyone who's ever tried to lose weight and had a spouse and your spouse is trying to support you but sometimes their support is saying you don't need that right that is not received well Right. Absolutely. You you need you need an unbiased third party to give you that bad news. Absolutely. But here's Absolutely. the thing. Not only do you need somebody to tell you when you need to course correct, but you need somebody who doesn't have a personal interest, somebody who mm -hmm. you can take what they tell you at face value to right. tell you what you are doing well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we don't believe ourselves when we say we're doing something well. And we don't believe people who are close to us because we think they're just saying it because they love us. That's exactly right. So yeah. true. And we, we, man, that's probably the biggest part of a change process is being able to isolate 
what you may think is a small victory, but victories don't come in quantities. They just, they just come in victories. You may think is a small victory, your inability to isolate and gravitate towards those wins as you're going along the route to success. Uh, it's a big part of it's a big part of why people sort of quit, you know? Yeah. It's easy to see what you haven't done. Humans are hardwired to do that. It's an evolutionary response. Like, it wouldn't have paid off well for us to come out of the cave and and marvel at the fire we made for 20 minutes. You know, you're likely to get killed by a warring tribe or eaten by a predator. So yeah. we're always looking for what's wrong. That's evolutionary. It, it makes sense. Now that we are in what we could call a civilized society, right? Uh, and the jury's still out on that. But now that we're in the civilized society, like that doesn't serve you well because you'll be so hypercritical of yourself You'll mm -hmm. talk yourself out of a process that you're actually winning as you're going through it. You'll talk yourself out of it by just isolating everything that's not right yet. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're right, Stephen. I absolutely do agree with that, and I absolutely forgot to bring it up. Uh, hiring a coach is okay for everybody. Not only is it okay, I highly advise it for everybody. Mm -hmm. Both Stephen and I have had a multitude of coaches as coaches to help coaches through coaching in some cases, you know, you, that's, that's a big thing. Like if you don't have the support around you, the brilliance of this time of life is that there are all levels, all levels and tiers of coaches that will fit into whatever type of budgetary constraints you have. And yeah. I mean that running, ranging from no cost uh, to, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, great point, man. Great point. Yeah. And and Ren, Ren is actually one of my coaches. I mean, it's almost impossible to get on his schedule anymore, but you know. Right. <laughs> it is so ironic because when I'm in Precision Nutrition Group asking questions about how things operate, pro coach and, and the, you know, some of the software that we used in our nutrition coaching, guess what, guys? Steven ends up being one of my coaches. Uh, so it's just, it's just what great coaches yeah. open the door to get great coaching. It's what great coaches do across the board. Uh, there's yeah. nothing odd about that or weird about it. The yeah. best coaches you'll ever meet in your life are being coached constantly by probably a team of other coaches. Uh, and that's yeah. absolutely normal. Yeah. And it's, it's not abnormal. As a matter of fact, the highest performers usually had the most coaches. At 100%. 100%. Yeah. Uh, we got to normalize that, man. Got to normalize yeah, we coaches having coaches we, we gotta we gotta normalize this I, idea that none of us are perfect and that we all have room to grow absolutely what i mean look i've got i have two coaches that i work with in the speaking world who are both world champions of public speaking right and guess what happens every time that they get ready to do a presentation they consult with each other right why? Because they know they need coaching too. Absolutely. And these are guys that are world champions. They're guys who are in a speaking hall of fame and they still ask for help with the thing that they're hall of famers for. Right. Right. So, you know, that's, I mean, if you, if you've reached that level of success and you're still asking for help, why would anybody else think that they've reached a the point that they no longer need to ask for help? 100%. So I, I just want to kind of back it up real quick to your story, and then I'm going to give you a, a, a chance to final word this. All right. When you look back at your story and you see all the things, and I'm bringing this up because you mentioned how it's difficult for us to sometimes see those successes. Right. If you look back at your lowest point, when you saw that commercial, mm -hmm. at, at that point, and, and I don't mean to rub this in on you. That's all right. But you, you got a, a job you hate. Right. You're stressed out. You've mm -hmm. had cars repoed. You've lost your apartment. Yep. You're having to drive back and forth. You've lost family members. Mm -hmm. Your mom is sitting here in the hospital and you feel helpless to be able to do anything about her situation. Right. It would have been the easiest thing in the world at that point for you to say, I'm a complete loser. I don't deserve to even be around. I'm absolutely useless to everybody. Absolutely. But instead, you took that initiative to say, you know what, I'm going to go out and have a positive impact in the world. Absolutely. I'm not going to let me beat this down. Absolutely. 
and it's one of those things, man, honestly, the first step is you have to become aware of what's going on around you. And you have to get that vision for what life could look like. Man, when you get that vision for what life can look like, you start taking actions towards that vision. Mm-hmm. Look, when, when Ren signed up as a NASM certified trainer, it wasn't just about, oh, I'm going to be a certified trainer. It was about the impact. So every day, I'm sure there were times you struggle. That's not an easy course to take. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and when you were struggling, you weren't sitting around thinking about how you're going to get paid $75 or $100 an hour as a personal trainer or whatever. Not at all. You were thinking about the lives you're going to impact and the actions you were able to take. You could always link back to what did you want that future you to look like? And and that just goes back to really what our whole conversation has been. Don't focus on the outcome. Mm -hmm. Focus on becoming a person that you want to be. 100%. That's what it comes down to. So I'm I'm, I'm now going to let you top that because I know that if anybody can top what I just said, it's it's friend John. (laughs) So... Here's, here's my sort of my philosophy for life. Overall, I work with the understanding that uh, that life is finite. It's not infinite, right? I consider us all to be dust on a coffee table. And at some point, the universe is going to look down and say, ah, we need to clean that. And the giant hand of the universe is going to wipe us away. And that's going to be it. Um, and I don't mean that in a morbid sense. I mean that in a sense of awareness. You know, I I saw a video with Gary Vaynerchuk. If you're not familiar with him, some people love him. Some people hate him. Uh, It's not important, Um, but he's very well known on social media in terms of business and and uh, and sort of, for lack of a better term, motivation. And a lady rolled up on him. Uh, She said, Gary, um, I love what you do. You know, I see you're on your way somewhere else. Can you give me three words that will motivate me? And he he looked at he said, you're going to die. Uh, and for me, that was conviction. Now I heard that many, many years after my situation. And I had that understanding many years before I heard it from him, but that's effectively the truth, man. Like, um, I did not fight billions of my brothers and sisters to fertilize that one egg to get here to the planet, to then decide that I was going to be average. That makes no sense. That's, that's just bad math. Right. That's, you know, how, how do we get here and then decide out of out of winning the ultimate race to get to existence that we are going to be average now? Now we can't do things. Now I'm incapable. Now I don't have the skill set. That's nonsense. So one of the reasons that I got one of the things that pushed me into taking that next action and Steven's absolutely right. The only action I had afforded to me at that time was calling that 800 number. I was like, okay, this is something that I can do. One of the things that pushed me in that direction was, number one, I felt like it was disrespectful to the people that poured into me to get to that point and then decide that I was going to quit. Right. Like, it didn't make sense. You know, my brother was the one that introduced me to exercise originally. My sister was the one that introduced me to comic books. I'm a comic book junkie. I started drawing comic books and that got me sort of interested in the form associated with being muscular uh drove me to fitness a little bit more and god knows my mother poured every good thing into me that she had you know working long hours as a registered nurse uh sending me to college you know being you know being my support system and at that point i felt it was disrespectful for me to cave after those people who were no longer here poured into me i became the extent of my mother's legacy my older brother and older sister didn't have any children. But my mother's line of family, I am the last descendant. I am the extension of her legacy. So number one was uh, was the fact that, you know, I wanted to be purpose. Number two was the fact that I wanted to fulfill the legacy of the people that poured into me. Um, and third, it always felt good to help. Helping was therapeutic for me. As I was working through grief and grief counseling, uh, I found out that when I was able to help people, uh, it instantly improved my mood. Like it, it, it was good therapy for me. So sort of the, the trifecta, the trinity of those three things, 
was why I decided to rest in the discomfort and take action and not run from it, not abuse myself in the many ways that people abuse themselves. Um, so if you're out there and you're going through difficult situations, recognize the fact that you have a choice. Mm -hmm. Every time something happens to you, you're immediately presented with a choice. Uh, and if you make a series of choices that are more in line with what your intention is, your vision is, um, those choices will compound in interest over time. The only thing that does not compound in interest is a zero deposit. So I just simply found a way to find a penny or a nickel or a dime, put it in the bank that is my life and allow it to compound. And over after 10 years of compounding, uh, the interest has grown me to the point where I am today. Um, so that's sort of my, you know, my two cents on the total subject, Stephen. Thanks so much for making space for me to, uh, for me to sh share a final thought here or two. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, you know, one thing I do want to just kind of highlight out of what you just said, because I, I know this is a question that comes up quite often with people, is we talk about discomfort and we talk about struggle. And I think that sometimes it can get a little bit confusing because at the same time, we tell people don't do the overly hard. We want to keep things simple. I know that's you sign off pretty much every social media post with let's keep it simple. Hey, pretty much everyone. Yep. And people might get confused because they might say, okay, well, what does it look like to keep it simple and to not overstress myself, but also still be able to push myself and know what discomfort is. So how does someone know when that discomfort is for growth? Mm -hmm. And how do they know when that discomfort is bad? Yeah, that makes sense, man. So you know when the discomfort is for growth versus it being bad when, when there's a logical next choice that you can make that pushes you forward. Like if you're doing a lot of things and you're not seeing any results, you're operating it where you make it a little bit too. Um, in simple choice is all you need because fundamentally when people, when people don't, when they don't gravitate towards com a consistency, uh, they will reach for complexity. Like if you're in a rush, you're much more likely to try to complicate things for the purposes of moving faster. Um, the, the issue is when you move faster, it makes things almost immediately more complex. Slow down, take the next choice, gravitate towards that and make the best next choice that you can make. Uh, instead of trying to do everything at once, man, uh, change has a tendency to favor evolution, not revolution. Uh, so when we try to revolution our lives in big ways, usually it's not successful. Usually we fall off that proverbial wagon. Yeah. Just look at the next choice. And as Will Smith said, lay that brick, that one brick as perfectly as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, don't think about the wall. Just think about that one brick. Um, you know, uh, it's a lot simpler if you do one thing at a time, the time's going to pass anyway. You don't want to get into a process where you're shortcutting your way to a long-term error, right? Yep. Speed compromises everything. I just don't, I don't like speed. I just yep. like to do what the, what's the next thing in front of you do it the best way that you can. Um, yep. And that'll help you understand whether you're adding unnecessary stress to your situation versus uh, taking the very next step. I hope that makes sense the way I explained it. Yeah, I, I think yeah. I think we can even maybe sum it and, and just kind of say, if you are getting stressed by your actions, they're probably the wrong actions. Probably the wrong actions. If probably it just feels actions. uncomfortable, keep going. Keep You're going. on the right path. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, that, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Good yeah. stuff, so, man. So that's just the short version of, of, of what you just said. What I rambled into. Yeah. But yeah. Very good. But, but, it, but it was in there. Right? It all came from you. I just, yeah, I just, so, I just repeated it. In there somewhere. It yeah. In there somewhere. So, Ren, man, appreciate you coming onto the show today, man, dropping nuggets left and right. People will probably have like pages and pages of material and notes that they've written down, hopefully. <laughs> but if they need more help, if they need to get a hold of Ren Jones, how do they do that? Man, you can find me all over the social media uh, inter interwebs, uh, Fitness Jones Training. Um, so on Instagram, it's just at 
Fitness Jones Training on Facebook. Fitness Jones Training. Uh, you know, those are my those are the best two outlets. If you feel like you just need to go to my website, it's fitnessjonestraining.com. Uh, I don't use my website a whole lot, but but it's there if you want to go take a look. Uh, but social media is probably the best place uh, to find me. And if you want to email me, you can email me at renjones at fitnessjonestraining.com. So I try to keep it pretty simple, man. Uh, yeah. You know, as as I say on my taglines on social media, right? Uh, let's let's keep the contact victory, right? <laughs> yeah, let's no no need in switching it. Let's keep the let's keep the contact simple too. Uh, but I I love to hear from you guys. Stephen can tell you, man, I'm I'm always up for some questions or some discussion or whatever you got going on. Don't don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, I'll I'll find the time to interact with the humans around me. Uh, I, I feel like I'm I'm purpose to do that. So I try to make sure I, I take every attempt to. Uh, take advantage of the opportunities to interact with the, uh, with, with all the humans out there. Uh, Steven, thanks so much for having me, man. This is awesome. Uh, I definitely, definitely appreciate you coming on today. And I will just tell y'all, if you, if you want follow Ren on social media, you will get a good dose of wisdom mixed in with some comedy and <laughs> lots and lots of pictures of Ren drinking tea. Definitely comedy. <laughs> You're definitely gonna have some comedy for sure. Comedy makes the world go around, man. It really does, man. It really does. Yeah. Well, Ren, appreciate you again for coming on to the show today. I do want to remind everyone that you can subscribe to the Unshakable Habits podcast by going to our YouTube channel, unshakablehabits.com slash YouTube, or you can find us anywhere that has your favorite podcast. This is Stephen Box reminding you that you are not meant to be average. You are meant to be unshakable. Thanks for listening to the Unshakable Habits Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, please subscribe at unshakablehabits.com slash YouTube or on your favorite podcast app. You can learn more about Unshakable Habits at unshakablehabits.com. Until next week, be unshakable, my friends.